Segments 44 and 45, the discovery of the galaxy and the rotation curve of the galaxy. What is this? How do we know it? How long have we known this? For most of us, it's pretty obvious that this is a spiral galaxy that we're looking at, something that's very far away, far outside of our Milky Way. But this is actually not an old history. This is something we've only known for about a century. The modern Milky Way dates back to the early 1900s, and we'll talk today about how that, that discovery was made. It needed modern distance measurements, and it needed a way to see around or through the dust in order to get a full picture of what the Milky Way looks like, since the, the Sun sits in the plane of the galaxy, and that plane is clouded up with, with uh, molecular clouds that contain both gas and dust that obscure the galaxy behind them. The original picture of the Milky Way dates back to the time of Herschel in the early 19th century where what Herschel did was take groups of stars in, in bins of magnitude starting with the brightest ones and then moving to fainter and fainter ones and use the 1 over r squared law to pl place them at some distance and he came up with a galaxy with the Sun in its center and uh, stars in a kind of irregularly shaped pattern around this that was more limited in one direction that we now know is out of the plane and, and more full in the direction of the plane but with a significant dip on one side due to the dust lanes. This pattern is kind of what you would see if you looked out at street lights from anywhere in town on a foggy night. You would see out to some finite distance with you in the center of the pattern because you'd get to a point where you couldn't penetrate through the fog anymore. It's completely analogous to what happens with the dust clouds in the galaxy. Our limited view then forces us to appear at the center of this irregularly shaped distribution. Uh, we, we can get some idea of how this works by, by looking at what an optical picture of the center of the galaxy looks like. So I've put this in galactic coordinates now with, with the disk of the galaxy stretching from left to right. And you're looking in towards the inner part of our galaxy in the constellation Sagittarius. And the Milky Way is, is modeled strongly by nearby dust clouds that obscure our view of more distant stars. If you look at wavelengths where you can penetrate through the dust, as in this image made with the uh, TUMAS project, a ground-based project run by NASA, at, in the near-infrared, where the extinction values are between, say, a fifth and a tenth of what we get in the visible, there's still some dust. You see that in the form of these, these red spots, which are clouds, but you can see that from where our perspective, looking towards the inner galaxy, you see the bulge of the galaxy, and very clearly outlined, you see the, the plane of the galaxy as well. The understanding of the dimensions of our galaxy, and therefore the existence of other galaxies, by learning about their distances as well, has two people really at the center of the story. One of them is Henrietta Leavitt, and the other is Harlow Shapley both of whom did their major work at the Harvard College Observatory in the early part of the last century. The work was supported by a group of people who were known as computers. This was back, these, these were the supercomputers of the day, a group of smart people who calculated things and, and, and recorded numbers and, and manipulated numbers together since there weren't any mechanical means for doing that. And Henry Etta Levitt started out as one of these calculators but turned out to have a flair for astronomy that, that led her to make one of the fundamental discoveries of the early 20th century. The discovery started with the study of what are called Cepheid variables. There's a certain part of the HR diagram where because of the size and luminosity of stars, they tend to be variable in nature. They tend to be unstable. This is called the instability strip. That's a, a patch and luminosity temperature space where basically all the stars within it are varying around. And the Cepheid variables have very regular light curves. This is now one period of a Cepheid light curve. And they vary by quite a bit, by almost a magnitude from one to the other in this characteristic shape where they rise steeply and then fall somewhat more slowly towards their minimum and then rise again. And they're very periodic. This is due to a, an instability in the star that causes an oscillation in the brightness and the opacity of the, the star. So the color and the brightness both change as a function of time. What Levitt did was, look, was looking at the properties of variable stars in the Magellanic Clouds. The Magellanic Clouds are companion galaxies to our own galaxy. They're about 150,000 light years, about 50 kiloparsecs 
from us, from the sun. So they're, they're quite far outside the galaxy, and they're fairly small objects. So what was the advantage of observing these clouds? The advantage was that the, that the clouds, in particular the large Magellanic Cloud, is close enough that we can see individual stars, but far enough that all the stars are at about the same distance from us. That means that the flux of the stars corresponds to their luminosity, because they're all at about the same distance. So the 1 over d squared is the same factor for all of them. So you can, in, without, until you know the distance to the, to the Magellanic Cloud, you don't know the, the absolute luminosity, but at least you know the relative luminosity of all the sources within it. And what Levitt's fundamental discovery was, was this. She observed many, many variables by looking at, at photographic plates taken one night after the next and, and, and looking for variables by comparing uh, the plates one to the next and seeing which stars changed in brightness and which ones didn't. And she noticed a, a very remarkable pattern that the more luminous the stars were, the longer the period of their variation from bright to faint and back to bright was. This is called a period luminosity relation. And what this acts as is essentially a little label on the forehead of each star saying, I am a 10 to the 4th solar luminosity star, or I am a 10 to the 3rd solar luminosity star. So you measure the period of the star, that period tells you how luminous it is. Then if you measure its flux, that gives you an indication of distance. Voila. With this as a distance indicator, Shapley could measure the distribution of globular clusters. Globulars all have variable stars in them, and by using the variables within the globulars, he could find the distribution of globulars uh, on the sky. And what he found was that that distribution was more or less spherical, but that the sphere was not centered on the sun, but was centered on a distant point in Sagittarius, uh, quite far from, from, from our own sun, just displacing then the sun from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So how did he do this? He used the, f the flux luminosity relationship, turned it around to say distance is equal to luminosity divided by 4 pi f to the 1 half. The one unfortunate mistake that Shapley made was he, he didn't recognize that the stars in the globulars were actually not Cepheids, but, but stars that were, were much less luminous than Cepheids. So he overestimated the size of the galaxy by con considerable amount. Once this problem was straightened out, we had a clear picture of the size of our galaxy and the recognition that these other spiral nebulae, the things like uh, M101 that I showed you at the beginning, were in fact other galaxies like our own. Another important subject is the determination of rotation uh, of galactic structure with rotation curves. We want to understand how our own galaxy is put together. And we do this by using the relationship between velocity, distance, and mass. The uh, 1 over r squared law, the Keplerian law, which we use in our own solar system for knowing the velocities of planets orbiting the sun. Remember in this case, it's only the mass enclosed within your orbit that counts, not the mass outside. And we measure the velocities by looking at, at uh, hydrogen lines from gas in the, in the galaxy. And if you look at the tangent point, the, the most extreme velocity towards or away, depending upon which side you're on, tells you what the velocity is at the tangent point. There's other motion along your line of sight, uh, but it's, it's motion of gas that's moving across the line of sight, so it'll have a lower velocity. So the, the most extreme velocity tells you the velocity at the tangent point, so at a given distance from the galactic center. Uh, when you do this for the whole galaxy on both sides, you produce what's called a rotation curve, which is velocity versus distance from the center of the galaxy. And you see for our galaxy, it going f uh, from uh, well inside the sun's orbit, so about a, a third of the way to the a third of the way out from the galactic center, out to about two and a half times the sun's orbit. That the the rotation curve, unlike the rotation curve of the solar system, which drops as one over the square of the distance, is flat or even rising as you go to higher distances. If you look at this rule of, for velocity, you can see how this works. G is a constant. And what you're looking at it, you look at velocity, is really the ratio of m to r. So for a point source where all the mass enclosed stays the same at all distances, the velocity drops because r gets bigger and g and m stay the same. If the density is constant, then um, you wind up having uh, you wind up having the mass increase rapidly as you go out for a spherical distribution, and the velocity will rise. If the density goes as one over r squared. Each shell adds 4 pi r squared times rho, but then this is independent of r, so, so m grows in proportion to, to r, and the velocity stays constant. 
If you actually look at the rotation curves of galaxies, you see they actually follow this rule. The velocity is constant outside of the inner part. This indicates that the uh, amount of matter in each successive shell is staying the same as you go out to very large distances in these galaxies. This is something that Vera Rubin discovered in the 1960s. Um, if, when you look at the light, however, when you look at the number of stars, this becomes something of a mystery because the number of stars drops rapidly as you go out, and yet the curve stays the same. This flat rotation curve then implies that there's a lot of mass that's not luminous, mass that's, that's dark. And this is the, one of the first bases for the existence of dark matter uh, in, in galaxies. There's a lot of matter out there that's not producing light, but yet contributes to the mass as you go out in the galaxy. So this is what we're seeing here. One final thing, using velocities to trace uh, things, is when we look at our own galactic center, now this is the inner parsec of our galaxy, there's a cluster of stars in there. There also appears to be a 4 million solar mass black hole. And we know about this black hole because of the orbits of the stars around it that tell us the amount of mass enclosed within their orbits. And that amount of mass is much larger than we would see from the, the number of stars there. But the space is so small, it's not some diffuse mass, it's a, it's a point mass that you have in there, and that mass we attribute to a 4 million solar mass black hole. Okay, so this is just explaining the same thing.